Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us. I am in my study on the southwest side of Madison right now. All of you are spread out from Arena to Portage, from California to Maine and New York and Ohio, any number of places where you may be tonight, but we're glad to have you with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are studying the book of Exodus, and tonight we are headed for Exodus chapter 23, so I want to invite you to be turning with me to Exodus chapter 23, and have a Bible of your own in your lap if you can, or your own device, and it would be awesome if you could join us there. We'll get to Exodus 23 in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and we would absolutely love to hear from you. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They have received the Ten Commandments at the base of Mount Sinai. And now they're in the process of receiving the rest of God's law as Moses gets it from the Lord and passes it along to the people. And so tonight then, we'll simply continue looking at various aspects of the law of Moses as it is revealed. So let's start tonight then with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 23. And we'll be looking at the first five verses. Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. You shall not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. Well, it looks like verse 1 is an elaboration on the ninth commandment and that they are not to bear false witness. But here we have a little bit more information. Not only are they not to bear a false report themselves, but they're also prohibited from collaborating with someone who is lying. That's what I understand this to be. So they can't be a part of a false conspiracy. You know, just because someone else started the lie doesn't mean that we can nod our heads in agreement and kind of join in or go along with it. That's not what we're able to do under the old law. The thought continues, notice in verse 2, with the warning against uh, getting pulled along by the crowd. And I think we would agree sometimes it can be incredibly difficult to do what's right and to tell the truth when we are completely surrounded by others who are lying. I think we think of the danger of peer pressure. I think as most of us have warned our children about that. I think we think of a huge mob of people uh, burning down a city or storming a capital or any number of things. Uh, we do things in large crowds that we may never have the courage to do on our own. So we don't always think straight when we're surrounded by people who are doing some terrible things. And so when something gets started, if we're in that area, it's very easy to get caught up in that. It's very easy to go along with it, very difficult to stop something like that. And so the Lord says, do not turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. And to me, it's especially interesting that uh, this mob justice mentality is tied to the warning in verse 3, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. And so it seems to me, at least, that the masses may often take the side of the poor man, not necessarily because the poor man is right, but simply because the poor man is poor. And so here's this dispute, maybe, between a rich man and a poor man, and God is saying, take the side of whoever's right. Don't just take the side of the poor man because you feel sorry for him. Don't just take the side of the poor man because you want to stick it to the rich guy. But you need to do what's right regardless of the wealth or lack of wealth of the person involved. Sometimes the poor man is wrong, and we need to recognize that. You know, don't assume that the rich man is bad just because he's rich. And so it's interesting to me... Um, that we may think the same thing today sometimes, and they were thinking the same thing back then, and God simply had to warn them about this going into it. So this is actually a part of the law. Don't be partial to a poor man in a dispute just because he's poor. It may not be that he's innocent. Well, in the second half of this first paragraph, we have the reminder to do right even when nobody is looking, and even when it might benefit your enemy. 
So if I'm under the old law, if I'm out on a walk and I see my enemy's ox or donkey wandering away, it may be so easy for me to, uh, you know, take some satisfaction in that. Oh, that is too bad, isn't it? Look at that. That, that guy who hates me, his, his ox is on the run. Too bad, so sad. Don't want to involve myself in that. But, uh, you know, that kind of thing happens every once in a while and just let it happen. Well, that's what's tempting to do. But notice God says, do what's right. I'm just paraphrasing there. You know, return the ox, return the donkey to its owner, even if the owner is your enemy. And the same thing goes for uh, coming across a donkey getting crushed by its load. Don't just let it happen because the donkey belongs to somebody who hates you. Uh, but instead, you are to help out the animal simply because it's the right thing to do. So God then is very clearly concerned with how we treat animals. And just that's part of doing the right thing. Under the law of Moses, animals were not to be abused. And I think that's something we can learn from that. God is concerned about animals. So if you see your neighbor's animals struggling, uh, help it, even if your neighbor hates you. Simply it's the right thing to do uh, to help out an animal in distress. Well, let's continue on with Exodus 23, verses 6 through 9. Exodus 23, 6 through 9. You shall not pervert the justice due to your needy brother in his dispute. Keep far from a false charge, and do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the just. You shall not oppress a stranger, since you yourselves know the feeling of his feelings of a stranger, for you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. In this first paragraph here, the uh, this paragraph anyway, the thought from the previous passage, I think, continues in a way it's tied to what came before it. Only notice this time God prevents his people from perverting the justice that's due to a poor man, to a needy neighbor. And I think this is also a valid concern. Why might somebody be tempted to pervert justice that's due to a needy neighbor? Well, probably because the needy neighbor doesn't have any way to defend himself. With no resources, the needy neighbor may not be able to fight back. And maybe it's tempting to take the side of the rich man, because maybe the rich man may help you out someday if you kind of lean in his direction in this dispute. And I know we're not under this law today, but this still happens, doesn't it? Often those who are poor are taken advantage of by those who are rich, because the poor have no resources to fight back. They don't have the lawyers... Uh, they don't have the financial resources to miss work, to take care of a lot of stuff. So this is offensive to God. So uh, don't lean toward a poor man and, and perverting justice in his favor just because he's poor. But in the same way, make sure that you don't do anything evil against a neighbor uh, in his need. In verse 7, not only are God's people prohibited from bearing false witness, but notice here they are specifically told to keep far from a false charge. So they are in no way to participate in this. If the people around you start throwing around false accusations, get some new friends. If that's all your people talk about is all the bad stuff other people do and some of that may or not be true, get out of there. Tied to this, they are also not to kill the innocent. They are not to kill the righteous. Uh, they may get away with it in terms of escaping from human authorities, but notice here God says that he will not acquit the guilty. He will uh, take care of that. Justice will prevail according to God at some point. In verse 8, we have a prohibition against taking bribes. Often, bribes have a way of hiding and blinding the clear-sighted and perverting justice. So justice should not depend on who's able to come up with the biggest bribe. And I think that's another uh, danger of, about the wealthy that we've talked about in that previous verse uh, bribery may be involved, and certainly if it comes down to who gives the bigger bribe, obviously the rich guy has the advantage there. So God says, don't fall for that. And then in verse 9, we have the reminder that the Israelites are not to oppress the stranger because they were once strangers in Egypt. Of all people, the Israelites should know better because they know how it feels. They are, look out, they are to look out for those people who are passing through and uh, to take care of them. Certainly they are not to abuse them. Well, let's continue then with Exodus 23, verses 10 through 13. Exodus 23, verses 10 through 13. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. 
Six days you are to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female slave as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. Now concerning everything which I have said to you, be on your guard, and do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. We're back to the Sabbath here, going back to, I think it was the fourth commandment, and that they were to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, in verses 10 and 11, in addition to honoring the Sabbath day, they are also to observe a Sabbath year, it seems, by not planting their fields every seventh year. So they were to allow the land to rest. That sounds today very scientific, doesn't it? Kind of taking care of the soil, soil conservation there, uh, preventing the next dust bowl. As I remember it, though, we have no record of the people ever doing this. In fact, I believe that's why God made the Babylonian captivity last 70 years. He was forcing the observance of all of the Sabbath years that his people had ignored in the past. According to the law, though, they were to let the land rest. And, and that would really be a test of faith, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine being a farmer. And when spring rolls around, not planting. I mean, it would violate <laughs> everything you know about farming. It would just violate everything you know about your own survival. You've got this seed that you saved from the previous year, year number six, and here you are in the spring or the planting time when, when you should be out there working the fields, and God says, don't do it. That right there is a huge act of faith, and so it kind of reminds me of the Sabbath day, doesn't it, you? When they were forbidden from collecting manna, uh, on the seventh day, remember they were to prepare for that day by collecting twice as much on day number six. Well, I think in the same way, uh, this would also take some planning if they were to survive as a nation. So this is a huge thing. You'd be working up to this in years one through six, kind of like uh, the whole situation with Joseph down in Egypt. I think we see some uh, parallels going on there, but it would be a huge leap of faith. And I'm not really sure where uh, the reference to the needy comes in, what that exactly means, do this so that the needy will, will be able to eat and so on. I'm thinking maybe it would allow the poor to harvest any crops that came up on their own as the field is resting. You know, if you don't plant anything in the garden, a lot of times something's going to come up. Uh, chances are to be weeds, but uh, we've had a lot of stuff like squash grow from previous years. Maybe you've seen that as well, so stuff that comes up volunteer. And so it, it may refer to this idea of gleaning, which is allowed later in the law. So because of the reference of doing the same with the uh, vineyards and the olive groves, let the land rest. Uh, but even in that seventh year, it seems that the poor are able to collect food from those uh, fields that are resting, because there would be a little bit there. Well, in verse 12, we get back to the seventh day. They were told to, uh, on six days, work and then rest on the seventh. And as I pointed out a few weeks ago, the really revolutionary thing here is for many people, work for six days. Uh, that's a hard time, a uh, hard thing to do for a lot of people. I mean, work is hard. Uh, there are certainly unpleasant things about most jobs, but God says work, work hard for six days, but rest on the seventh was a part of the old law, allowing not only the people, but also the animals to rest. That's something else we need to note here. So once again, God is concerned that the people care for their animals. Uh, it's not good for people or animals to work seven days straight with no time off, with no break. So uh, God is the one who brought us the weekend. He wanted us to rest for one day out of every seven. And in the last verse, we have God's warning that the people are to be on their guard. They are not even to mention the names of other gods. That, that's how serious this is, because it will be a real temptation. Well, let's continue with Exodus 23, verses 14 through 19, the next little section. Exodus 23, verses 14 through 19. Three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you, at the appointed time in the month of Beeb, for in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. And you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the firstfruits of your labors from what you sow in the field, also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the fat of my feast to remain overnight until morning. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother." 
here at the end of the chapter, we have a quick outline just introducing three of the uh, major feasts that they were to observe. The feasts where all the men were to come before the Lord to sacrifice. And I think later we're going to find it's implied that their families can come with them. Uh, but the men, the leaders of each family at least, had to show up before God three times a year. And this is different from the New Covenant. Under the New Covenant, we don't really have a, a yearly calendar of celebrations that God has given us to observe as religious ordinances. But we're on a weekly schedule, aren't we, in the church? The, the first day of every week, it is something of a special day, the Lord's Day. It's a time for us to assemble together. Well, back then, God wanted them to observe the Sabbath on a weekly basis. But they were also to come together as a nation at least three times a year. So there was some structure to their year. And it appears that a lot of this is based around planting and harvesting. Notice the first was for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they would eat unleavened bread for a week. This was to commemorate the whole situation with them leaving Egypt. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The second feast was the Feast of the Harvest where they would bring God the first fruits of their crops. So right as the first things were coming in, you know, in our culture today, that would be probably June, as the first things are coming in out of the garden. And then uh, later, this holiday, this feast, was known as Pentecost. And it was later used as a way to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, on the anniversary, is the way they perceived it. That's their tradition. That's not outlined in Scripture. I'm just saying that for a long time, the Jewish people associated uh, Pentecost with the giving of the law of Moses. But it's interesting if we think about that, that the law went forth from Mount Zion in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And, you know, which they at least perceived as being the same day that the law of Moses was given many years earlier. And then if you remember your history, we have 3,000 people dying at the giving of the first law with 3,000 people baptized at the giving of the new law. So it's kind of interesting to see those parallels. So we've got the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, we've got the Feast of the Harvest, which was also later known as Pentecost, and then the third was the Feast of the Ingathering, and that was to celebrate the end of harvest as they brought in everything at the end of the season. And I believe this one was also known as the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, if I remember correctly, when they would live in tents for several days to remember living in tents in the wilderness. And we aren't given many details at this stage. I mean, we're just given the, the rough outline of these three big feasts. Uh, more information certainly is coming. It'll be revealed as they need it. Uh, but this is the outline for the first uh, three big feasts where every male would have to appear before the Lord in worship. And then notice we have a few random instructions, uh, not really seemingly tied together too well, but in verses 18 and 19, they aren't to mix the sacrificial blood with the leavened bread. Uh, they were not to leave the fat from the sacrifices out overnight. They were to take care of that as instructed. Uh, they were to give God the first fruits of their crops. And then they were not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. All right, that's just gross, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, that's just wrong, I think, in God's eyes. And a lot of people have wondered why. Some have suggested this was maybe tied to some kind of pagan ritual. Maybe this is something you're going to see when you get to where you're going. Don't do it. Don't do that thing that they did. That may be it. Uh, but there's the other possibility that, that this is just wrong in God's eyes. You know, we aren't told. Maybe God just thought that's disgusting. It's just like a terrible thing to do. Um, you know, and I would kind of tend to agree with that second option, that it's just disgusting. I mean, to milk a goat, taking the milk that was intended for the baby goat, to boil that milk, and then to kill the baby goat by boiling it in its mother's milk. That's just messed up. I mean, whoever would think to even do that it just has a, a messed up brain, in, in my opinion. But this right here is actually why Jewish people, even today, if they are eating strictly kosher, are not allowed to eat cheeseburgers. This is the cheeseburger verse. Do you see cheeseburgers in this verse? They do. Um, the faithful Jewish people, if they're trying to follow the dietary laws from the Old Testament even today, no cheeseburgers. So they have taken this verse and they have extrapolated it to prohibit mixing dairy products with beef. And so in their view, eating a cheeseburger is the same as boiling a baby goat in its mother's milk. It's just gross to them. It's just something that shouldn't be done. And in theory, I suppose you could be eating cheese that was made from milk that was intended for the cow that you're eating. <laughs> 
which is a bit disgusting, I suppose. I'll kind of admit that if that's, <laughs> but it is tasty. You know, but as we noted a, a week or two ago, thankfully we're no longer under the old law. And now we can even add bacon to our cheeseburgers, can't we? So we can have the beef, we can have the cheese, and we can have the bacon added on there. So I'm just saying, we can do all kinds of weird things with our food that uh, they were not allowed to do under the old covenant. But I thought, that po I thought I'd point that out uh, as the cheeseburger verse, because uh, even today, uh, Orthodox Jews uh, trace their not eating bacon, uh, well, obviously bacon, but uh, cheeseburgers, uh, to this verse about boiling a baby goat in its mother's milk. All right, let's continue with uh, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 26. Exodus 23, 20 through 26. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. You shall not worship their gods nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. But you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. In the first part of this passage, notice God explains that he's sending an angel before them, and that this angel will be leading the people through the wilderness on God's behalf. And the angel not only will guide and lead, but he will guard and protect them. Um, that's his job. This is what he'll be doing. So the people have got to do their part by obeying the angel. They are not to be rebellious because the angel represents the Lord. The angel bears the Lord's name. If they obey the angel, though, God promises to protect them. God will be an enemy to their enemies, an adversary to their adversaries. And certainly they're heading into a land where they will have many enemies. You know, where they are right now, out there in the wilderness, nobody really cares that they're there. This is a barren land. We looked at some pictures of the potential from Mount Sinai a few weeks ago. And nobody really minded them being out there in the middle of nowhere. But they're heading to a very populated area. And once they start getting closer to the promised land, they're going to run into some people who are uh, pretty fierce. And uh, they want to obey the Lord so that the angel will fight on their behalf. For their part, though, the people are not to worship the gods that the locals worship. They are not to imitate the people by doing what they do in terms of worship. Isn't that a temptation today for New Testament Christians to look around at the the religious world as a whole and say, ooh, that over there looks good. Let's bring that into our worship here. And, and ooh, they're doing something kind of cool over here. We're going to bring it in. And before long, worship resembles nothing like the first century church. That's a temptation. It's a real danger. Anyway, they are to destroy the sacred pillars when they move into this new land. So their altars, the things that they worship, the uh, pillars that they have as a part of their worship, so they are to serve God, and if they do that, God will provide them with food and water, just as he's doing for them out in the wilderness. And if they obey, God will bless them in other ways, protecting them from sickness, preventing miscarriages, uh, ensuring that no one is barren. You know, So if, uh, if they obey, God will uphold his end of the covenant, and he'll do some amazing things for them that really they wouldn't be powerful enough to do on their own. Well, this is kind of the middle of a paragraph, so let's continue this thought into the last paragraph. And let's conclude tonight with Exodus 23, verses 27 through 33. Exodus 23, verses 27 through 33. I will send my terror ahead of you, and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets ahead of you, so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. 
for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land, because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. In verse 27, God promises to make the people afraid of them. And to me, that seems like half the battle right there. If the enemy could be completely terrified of an invading army, that right there is huge. And the people may not realize this at the time, but God has already done this. At the time they are hearing these words, God is already working on that. Uh, when we get over to Joshua, uh, when the spies cross over and scope out Jericho, remember they learned from Rahab the people are terrified of what God had done by parting the Red Sea and using that to destroy the Egyptians. That was 40 years in the past. It would be 40 years in the future from here. But the people of Jericho, they were still terrified of what happened 40 years previously. So God was, you know, promising that terror right here, and he was already working on it even before he made the promise. At the end of verse 27, because of this, God will cause their enemies to turn their backs on them. In other words, their enemies would flee. So they weren't shunning them, they were running. In verse 28, God promises to use hornets to get the locals to leave even before the Israelites show up, which is kind of cool. Uh, today, imagine if we could weaponize hornets. Um, we would hardly need an army. If that's all we had, that right there would be absolutely huge. If we could tell tens of millions of hornets to go attack certain people at a certain place at a certain time, we could win just about any battle, I would say, even today. But that's what God promises to do. If these people will simply do what they're told, he'll make everything work out for the best for them. In verses 29 and 30, though, God explains this will not happen all at once. But instead, God will remove the locals in the promised land little by little. And the reason is, somebody's got to take care of the land. You know, somebody's got to go deer hunting. And if God drives everybody out, if all the Canaanites and all the others just leave, poof, all at the same time, uh, it would take all the Israelites some time to get moved in. And in the meantime, the crops and the herds and the wild animals would just get completely out of control. And so God says that his people would move in slowly over a period of time. In verse 31, God gives the boundaries that the people would inhabit, assuming that they are obedient. From the Red Sea, um, there kind of to the southeast, to the Mediterranean to the west, from the wilderness in the south all the way up to the Euphrates River in the north. And in those last two verses, God then prohibits his people from making covenants or agreements with the, these people who are living in the land. So they are not to cooperate with them, but they are to remove them from the land completely. There is to be no compromise. Otherwise, terrible things will happen. They will be a snare to you, God says. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 23. So we've continued looking at a few more details concerning the law of Moses. And we hope to get back to this next week. We're just working our way through this, and I think we've learned a few things, and I think some interesting lessons tonight, and some uh, modern history thrown in there as well, uh, the cheeseburger verse and some of those other things. But uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad that you were with us. If you have any questions, any concerns about class, anything that we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help you as a congregation, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. Uh, send a text, give a call. 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. I'm looking forward to seeing most of you this coming Lord's Day. Let's go to God in prayer as we close. Our Father in heaven, thank you for being so good to us as your people. Tonight we're thankful for your law, both old and new. We're thankful for the lessons that we've learned from the law, but certainly tonight we're thankful especially that we're under a new law delivered by the apostles as they preached your good news on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem so many years ago. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.